All right, so uh, we're here to talk about what's going on as far as the 2025 draft. I know we're a long ways off, but I know there are some college football fans who might be checking us out, uh, and and well, I would uh, assume. But bottom line is, is keep in mind that this is not just about the 2025 draft. This is also gives us an opportunity to kind of get a, a head start on the 2024 college football season. Uh, because some of these players will not be in the draft, but hopefully eventually they will in the next year or two. Uh, a great many of them will. And then we'll also just talk about some of the other guys also to keep an eye on uh, in each conference, because we are going to be previewing every conference in college football real soon. Trust me that. Uh, no later than I'd say next month, July, I believe. Well, actually, that's two months from now, because this 31st, guys, are we still in May? Yep. Last day of May. So there you go. So uh, once we hit into July, uh, we're going to start with some really cool interviews. Uh, I, I'm personally going to be interviewing a ton of uh, really good uh, uh, writers, uh, analysts, and so forth from uh, some of the top programs in the country. So that's going to be awesome. Um, I'm hoping to get some players on as well. Matter of fact, one of the players that I am uh, kind of getting close. I tried to get him last year. I couldn't. Uh, the media rep says I have a chance to possibly get him next month is a player we're going to be talking about on this show. So I'm excited about possibly getting that interview set up. So check out for that. And then also for scouting Hayden, of course, uh, is going to be continuing. Uh, as a matter of fact, Hayden, uh, you, I know Dave's done some solo uh, shows and, uh, and videos and so has uh, John. So uh, what do you have up your sleeve for some solo videos? What are you thinking of? Yeah, absolutely. So usually just throughout the season and throughout the off season, I'll usually just have a YouTube short or maybe a list of guys that I put together that I think uh, look really intriguing. Sometimes I'll just have some crazy thought that crosses my mind that I just really want to talk Don't about and make a video about it. Uh, so for example, you can expect a video from me sometime. Uh, I talked about it in a previous live stream about the value of the backup quarterback and really specifically the third string, maybe the more of the developmental quarterback and what kind of value you can get out of that from a player who might need to sit for a year or two, three or four before they can touch the field. So uh, it's going to be a lot about roster management and construction, but uh, those are the types of things that are up my alley. So that's what you can expect from me for the next couple months at least. Excellent. And of course, uh, Dave, uh, you're going to be working on a ton of stuff so much, so much that you just, you don't know how to fit it all in. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, if there are more hours in the day, I'd be a lot more successful than I am right now with this stuff, but I promise it's uh it's for, not a, for a lack of effort, but I will put as much content out as I can over the summer. And again, I think the most important thing, what we do right now, what we're doing on this call and what we want to do the rest of the summer is just get the ball rolling with a lot of the discussion and, and, and kind of open the door on what the process is like to start evaluation uh, from our perspective. You know, we don't have all the resources of an NFL team. We don't have all the tape, but we do have some from last year. And, you know, it's kind of fun just to peel back the curtain a little bit and just say, okay, this is how the process starts, but it is a long drawn out process. And it's, uh, this is just step one. And right now you're just in information gathering mode. That's really what I kind of turn this as right now. It's not as much scouting as it's just get as much information as you can. And then you have something to jump off of in the coming months. Yeah. And John uh, can't wait to look at his videos. Cause I know he would like to, he, he's, he's talked about uh, putting together some really cool discussions with some uh, veterans in the scouting industry They've got tons of awesome stories that they're going to be able to go back and forth on. So look out for those. They're coming soon uh, with uh, with John Cooper here, of course, of our lads. Speaking of our lads, which we can't talk enough of here on the our lads channel, you've got the our lads draft guide. So this is out. So uh, matter of fact, I was interviewing. Um, matter of fact, I think it's on the screen behind me. Cole Thompson. Uh, from the Texans and uh, a few other interviews. As a matter of fact, I got an interview uh, with Charles Goldman, who covers the Chiefs later today. Uh, Chiefs fans, of course, they've had a, a you know really tough go of it the last couple of years. Um, but uh, uh, talked about how a lot of their scouting reports here for the teams are in the guide. So keep that in mind. As a matter of fact, uh, John Osher from Jaguars.com I spoke to in three, I believe it was John, three of the Jags uh, free agents are in the guide. So uh, it's not just guys that are drafted. There's some key free agents to keep an eye on. And that's why even getting the guide now is a valuable tool. And we don't have, of course, the draft review guide out yet, but this is the 2023 version with Richardson on the cover. I know I hear Caleb, Caleb Williams on the cover, but that's boring. I mean, Richardson wasn't the first pick in the draft. Why would we put Caleb Williams? Don't do that guys. Come on. 
Let's put someone. What's your vote, Hayden? Give me a vote for who you think should be on the cover of the draft review guide. Give me someone creative. Mm, someone creative. I really yeah. liked uh, Cooper DeGene a lot. I know that Coach Ooh, Cooper had him as well. I think that'd be a heck of a cover wow. athlete. Okay, I don't mind that. What about you, Dave? I think the last of the first, or sorry, the second to last of the first round quarterbacks to go, JJ McCarthy. The fact that he went after Michael Penix, the fact that I think he went to the best offensive system of all the rookie quarterbacks. And again, we all know this that we can scout quarterbacks, but what system and the surrounding situation you get put into determines a huge part of your success at the next level. And that's where I think if, if I had to pick one system to go into, coach, surrounding personnel, it's Minnesota. And when you're looking at the, the rest of the quarterbacks in that class that went in the first round. So I think that's a guy that would be a, a nice sneaky, nice sneaky shot by the R lads manager to put on the cover of that, of that guide. All right. And let us know comments, uh, whether you want to comment live, we are doing this live. We have a bunch of live programming on this channel now. So if you can catch us live, keep in mind the comments, uh, questions, things of that nature during the show, we would get to, uh, so you can do that. Or of course, uh, if you are unable to watch it live, it'll be on demand and uh, we'll still take your questions and comments too. So again, our lads, uh, not only of course, for the channel here, you can subscribe, which is what we uh, would want you to do if you're interested in these types of videos and, uh, like, and share do the rest, you know, the drill. Let's get right to it. It's the big 10. We talked the sec offense and defense the last couple of weeks. Now we turn our attention to the new big 10. So really this should be what the big 14 are we up to 14 now something like that 16 I think, I, are we, I think it's 16 but don't quote me but it's it's no longer the big 10 on it but you know it's there's too much to change there's too much material that you have to change there so it's I so guess. no matter what you call it guys I'm, I'm thinking big 10 no matter what all right let's get started with now since we don't have three you guys we have two so we're doing something just a little bit different and uh, i'm gonna hold that uh for a few minutes so uh but uh Real uh, interested to see how that goes down. Okay, so let's talk about quarterbacks on your list, guys. Start with, uh, by the way, out of the five quarterbacks that you guys zeroed in on that you wanted to discuss today, um, actually, I think there are six. Uh, out of those six, I think six of uh, five of them are transfers. So how about that? Dave, let's start with you and Will Howard at Ohio State because this could be – uh, well, look, really, even the, the the first couple, Will Howard and Dylan Gabriel, but I think Howard maybe more because Ohio State uh, right now is one of the co-favorites to win the national championship, and he's the quarterback of that football team. Yeah, I mean, surround, uh, talk about surrounding situation. You know, you're going from Kansas State to Ohio State. You know, it, it's I'm most curious to see how he responds to such an uptick in talent around him. Um, you don't always like to, A, use it against a quarterback if he has – great talent around him. Jaden Daniels, for an example, I didn't use it against him that he had Malik neighbors and Brian Thomas to throw to. Um, but you also, at the same time, don't always want to use it as a crutch that Will Howard has not had a lot of talent. Can you name one player other than Ben Sanat, the tight end who went to Washington uh, with Jaden Daniels, coincidentally, can you name one player at receiver or tight end that he's thrown to that has been a big time player? at Kansas State? And the answer is no. Malik Knowles, maybe, who went undrafted. So this is a former three-star recruit that was probably just as good on the hardwood, a basketball player, a thousand-point score in high school as he was on the football field. He lost out on starting competition jobs with Skylar Thompson and Adrian Martinez. He got on the field because of injuries. It wasn't because he stood out in practice or in summers and, and workouts leading up to. But when you saw his best football, you saw something. And you saw it on a six foot five, 242 pound Ben Roethlisberger type frame. You know, and, and size does come up. It came up a lot this past draft class. It came up a lot a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of years ago as well. And if you see enough from a frame like this and you see the kind of the dual threat that Will Howard is, it gets you excited. But the one issue is you didn't see a lot of big time throws from him. He didn't throw the ball downfield with a lot of success. And again, was that scheme? Was that personnel dependent? We don't know, but we're about to find out because he's, he's surrounded with as much talent as any quarterback in the country. And if you're still going to see these shortcomings at Ohio state, then I think you're going to have to bump them down a significant amount, but the, just the pro readiness in his game from the timing mechanics, consistency, and most importantly, decision-making He's a really good decision maker, and he has very good natural touch and accuracy in the football to all three levels. So the traits that I care about the most he has, 
but we need to see him play at a high level in these high leverage situations, which we know he'll see plenty of in 2024. Yeah, he had some uh, competition, too, over the last few years. Uh, Adrian Martinez was there, Nebraska transfer. Isn't Adrian Martinez like in that – he's in that in summer UFL. league now? Yep, the UFL? Yep. Okay. He's playing right now, actually. I think I saw him on TV the other night. But And, you know, Scott Thompson, you know, because of injury, he started a playoff game as a rookie, a seventh-round pick in Miami. That's I mean, it. He's in the league. He's a backup. You know, these aren't any slouches that he was up against. But, yeah. Um, you know, him not, him not beating Adrian Martinez was like probably the first red flag of, of his career. Nothing that you're going to hold against him now, but it just goes to show this is not a, a five-star top of the no. line recruit. You know, he, he kind of earned his way to where he is now, but now the pressure's on. And, and then also, uh, I think part of the reason why it was easier for him to transfer too, even though Kansas state under climate is getting better and better every year, uh, is Avery Johnson. That kid has got a ton of potential. I think he was a true freshman last year. Yeah. Looks the part. Uh, that kid needed to get out there and play. And yep. so it was time for Will Howard. It was perfect situation for Will Howard to move on and let Avery Johnson take over uh, the roles at Kansas State. And, and by the way, uh, with Howard, I wonder how the offense is going to run at Ohio State. We'll talk more about that, of course, uh, later in the summer. But that's something to keep an eye on because this has been mostly like a pass-first type of offense. Now, with Howard, you wonder, is there going to be a lot more running involved? A lot more Because we haven't seen that type of quarterback at Ohio State for a few years. So They do. They have – they have – the best freshman wide receiver we have seen in quite some time, but they also had the best dual rushing attack, the best backfield in college football by a pretty wide margin. If you ask me, we'll talk about those guys yep. a little bit later. So yeah, I could see more run heavy, but no matter what, what I care the most about, he's going to be in high pressure situations against some good defenses and he's going to have enough town around him. So to me, Will Howard has the most to gain. Uh, let's, uh, before we talk about a couple of other veterans, uh, let's talk about, um, a young kid, uh, Hayden that you wanted to discuss Mac Brosmer, uh, from, uh, Minnesota via New Hampshire, FCS, New Hampshire. So this is going to be a big unknown, uh, to a lot of college football fans, maybe even to Minnesota fans. Yeah, absolutely. Coming from a school like New Hampshire, an FCS school, he's not going to be a guy that a lot of people have heard of, but he's going to be someone that is probably going to step in right away, probably going to start for Minnesota this season. Uh, uh, their starting quarterback from last season, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, his name, excuse me, ended up transferring over to Rutgers. So it looks like Brosmer should be in line to be the starting quarterback. Uh, for those who don't know who he was, which I'm sure is going to be a lot of you guys, he was a first-team All-American last year at the FCS level at New Hampshire. Uh, he led the FCS in passing yards last year, threw for 3,500 yards, 29 touchdowns, uh, five interceptions, and he rushed for uh, excuse me, an additional five more touchdowns on the ground. Um, now, going to a school like Minnesota, like we talked about, where you're going to be playing in the Big Ten, you really want to see – some sort of success against an FBS opponent. They only played one last year, which was Central Michigan. Uh, that's as high up as they went, so no power, no power five opponents, excuse me, uh, but still did throw for 500 yards and four touchdowns against uh, Central Michigan. So against the best competition he probably faced all year, uh, still stepped up in a big fashion and really feel like he's going to be someone that's ready for the big stage. Had an opportunity to look through some of his film. Uh, he's got a massive arm. He's got a rocket of an arm. Uh, can fit the ball into really tight windows, thought he had great accuracy at the intermediate level. Uh, like I talked about, um, really just getting the ball from the hash to the opposite numbers, he can get that, make those type of throws in a split second, made some really crazy wild throws on film. Uh, there's a couple things that still feel like he needs to improve on, kind of looked like a statue in the pocket, uh, had a little bit of trouble uh, escaping pressure, which if you're playing for a school like Minnesota where you're facing pass rushes like Ohio State, Michigan, those type of schools. You probably want someone that's able to maneuver the pocket a little bit better. Uh, thought ball placement needed a little bit of work. He has some trouble leading receivers, some questionable overthrows. Um, still going to be a project, so he's not going to come in and uh, to Minnesota and be an entirely finished product, but just watching the tape, you can tell there's a lot of talent there and should be someone that uh, uh, can succeed in the Big Ten. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because you got Howard, more of an athlete, going to a more of a passing offense, and then you've got um, this uh, uh, kid going to a program that is more of a rushing offense, and then he sounds to be more of a passing guy. Like you're not bringing him in to hand the ball off forty times a game, uh, fifty times a game. So um, that should be interesting. 
and uh, actually a couple of running backs that you might want to keep an eye on as well that we'll talk about uh, or at least mention on this program. Okay, uh, let's now talk about a couple of more on your end, Dave, a couple of veteran guys, Gabriel and uh, Drew Aller from Penn State. Uh, Gabriel, of course, coming up from Oklahoma. I guess the big question there is, is how is he going to do without Jeff Levy? So we'll see yeah. how that works out. But Gabriel, tons of experience, very good, accurate player. Is Does he have what it takes, though, to be a next level guy, an actual, you know, serious pro prospect? Yeah, I mean, that that's this is also this time of year. It comes up a lot just because you're a great college football player does not mean you project to the NFL. It, it's in some cases, it's two different games. And you know, at five foot 11, 204, you know, he has to have some elite traits to even be considered a guy. I know at this time last year when he was at Oklahoma, he had a, a priority free agent grade. So what, what that's essentially saying is we're probably not going to use it. Nobody would use a draft pick on this guy, but he would be sought after. Uh, following the draft to got, get in your quarterback room and see what you got. You know, he, he played really well in 2023. He was a fun player to watch, dual threat. Um, you know, he's got 150 touchdowns, you know, 25 of which are on the ground over his career between UCF and Oklahoma. And, you know, the, the question is just how much talent does he really have? Does he have the NFL arm? Can he make the throws uh, across the field? Can he drop the ball in a bucket down the field? You know, it's, can he evade pressure uh, in, in college, can he break through contact? You know, 204 pounds is about as small as you're going to get in the NFL at that position. And you're talking about a guy that has a a maxed out frame. He's five foot eleven. You know, he he's a verified under six feet tall, and that's you can count on one hand how many quarterbacks have had any success in the NFL at that size. So again, these are all metrics that you want to put down on your sheet, but you don't want to hold it against them. What what I try to do with a Dylan Gabriel type, especially now that he's going to his third program, and if he has success at three different programs. All right. That that's going to that's going to mean something to me, at least that sure. he can adapt to a new situation, new players, new talent around him. Um, you know, he's not exactly playing in the, the best defensive conferences in college football. But now I think now that he's in the Big Ten with Oregon making that tra- change, you know, that's another thing that he can go out there and prove. And, uh, you know, by no means am I considering this guy going to be a, a day one or even day two pick. But if he puts together another strong season, that production combined with some of the, the playmaking skills and, and off-platform throws that he can make, uh, it, he he's worth looking into, I should say, on day three, if he can play at that level in 2024. And who knows? Maybe he's – because right now, to me, I think he does have the look of, hey, maybe he could be a really good backup or maybe he could be a right. Gardner right. Minshew uh, yep. type of prospect. Absolutely. Um, I, mean, I mean, backup quarterbacks – Look, look at what Atlanta just did. <laughs> they just signed Kirk Cousins. They draft uh, Michael Penix. I think the value of the backup quarterback is is kind of overlooked, and that they, that's touching on what Hayden just talked about at the start of the show. It's a real thing, and I think as the NFL starts to catch up to the obvious information that's right in front of us, but some of us choose to ignore, that you need to have backup quarterbacks in the NFL. I, mean, I think we saw a record last year in terms of how many quarterbacks oh. started the game. So even if you don't project Gabriel to your stereotypical starter, that does not mean you cross him off the board. That does not mean that you don't pay attention to what he's doing this fall. Okay. And then uh, what about uh, Aller? Uh, Because Aller did not have the season everybody was anticipating. And especially the Michigan game, that was the big one. That was the one. All right, let's, let's see, especially Ohio state as well, but it was all right. It was the road. We'll give him a mulligan. Well, yeah. nah, it, it just it wasn't the season that many people thought. Now they have a yeah. new coordinator, so that maybe that was maybe that was his fault. So what do you think? Hey. You still there, Dave? Got me? Now I got you back. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, I just saw my mic went off. Okay. You're um there. I'm really intrigued by this kid. Um I'm going to give a little – here's, again, offseason. This is kind of some of the stuff that I do. You know, look at the process. Where someone was evaluated as a high school recruit is not going to sway someone's draft slot in my eyes. Like, I'm not going to go back and say, oh, this kid was the number one oh, yeah. recruit in the country. But I just want to give you something to chew on here. He was the number one quarterback recruit in 2022, five-star. And in his first year as a starter – Right, he was second in the country quarterback to interception ratio to Bo Nix. All right, and he didn't play in that simple as an offense as Bo Nix did. But let's go back to this high school recruit talk. Number one overall recruit in 2021, the number one recruit was Quinn Ewers, and number two was Caleb Williams. 
In 2020, Bryce Young was number one. C.J. Stroud was number three. In 2019, Spencer Rattler was number one. Jaden Daniels, number two. Bo Nix, number three. In 2018, Trevor Lawrence, number one. Justin Fields, number two. So to me, this looks like a little bit of a trend that we might want to pay attention to. Yeah. Drew Aller was the number one guy in 2022. He did not play poorly in his first season as a starter, by the way. No. You had to give some grace to a guy that w- was uh, was a, a first-year starter that played in some big games. By no means do I walk away from even the little amount of tape that I saw in 2023 and say, hey, this guy's a QB1. But I'll tell you what, his tools are second to none in this class, especially in this Big Ten. Six foot five, 241 with really good athletic ability. He can run. He's a truck. They use him as a true freshman behind Sean Clifford, an eventual NFL draft pick to the Green Bay Packers to what? Run the ball, short yarded situations. He's a, a legitimate dual threat. He's not the dual threat that Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams was. But again, I want to see him. Look how many years it took for those guys to reach the level they were at. So I'm not writing this kid off in a wide open quarterback class nationally, not just the Big Ten, that this kid is right up there with the best in the nation when you're talking about tools. But we need to see, and you know, tools are not enough at the quarterback position. We know that. But you know, his receivers dropped 11 pass, 11% of his pass attempts. That is an extremely high number, you know, and, and I think that, that he did lose his number one threat, Lambert Smith, to Auburn in the transfer portal about a month ago. Uh, but, you know, this kid, he set an FBS record, 311 passing attempts to start off his career without an interception. Ro- RG3, right? <laughs> Robert Griffin III had the previous record at 209. So this kid demolished the all-time FBS record. And I think there's just something about ball protection that I like. The tools are there. And, hey, I'm going to keep an eye on this trend of being the number one quarterback recruit in the country. Well, they have a really good uh, backfield. Yep. Uh, and, again, I'm, I'm assuming Allen and Singleton are, are back. Uh, yep. So, um, but like you said, that wide receiver room, I, I would guess they've landed some transfers uh, because, yeah, that, that was not a, a really good room last year. Now you take away a couple of guys, including Lambert Smith. Uh, and that, and then one of the guys we're all going to talk about is, is still there, uh, but he's a tight end. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's really going to be the difference. He can't do it on his own. He's got a new coordinator. That's nice. But we'll see what kind of talent he has uh, and who's he going to be able to throw to. So. Mm. Because they could be a, a they could be a nice little sleeper pick to win the national championship. We know they're talented; they're always talented. But that quarterback position is one of the key spots that keeps holding them back. Yep. So, okay, uh, let's uh, wrap up with uh, another transfer, uh, Hayden. Uh, you're going uh, the Indi- the Ohio to Indiana route with Curtis Rourke. Uh, this name has been around for quite a while because his brother played before him, but. Uh, this kid is now going to get an opportunity to play in the Big Ten. Yeah, absolutely. So this was someone that caught my eye immediately. I actually had a chance to go to Ohio University out of the back in person and watch him play last year against Central Michigan. So he's someone that I thought had the potential to come out last year, decided to return to school, is going to end up going to the Big Ten uh, at Indiana. Uh, he was second team all Mac last season. Uh, really the first thing you notice about him is his build. He's six foot five, or at least listed at six foot five, 231. Looks like a prototype quarterback at the next level. Uh, had r- really impressive pinpoint accuracy downfield. Uh, he made some throws throughout the season that really wowed you. Uh, has an NFL arm. He's a considerable athlete. He's going to be someone that's going to pick up uh, yards with their legs. There's a couple things that I still think he needs to work on. Uh, certainly his mechanics when he gets under pressure. Um, I think become or start to get a little bit messy. So maybe operating a little bit better under pressure, which for a lot of quarterbacks, that's the case. So he's not uh, the exception to that, but uh, some he's going to have to get better at. And he's going to be going to a school uh, in Indiana that for the last couple of years has really been deficient in talent. When you look at the other teams in the big 10, uh, there's a receiver that they got from the group of five uh, transfer up that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. That's going to help him out quite a bit. Okay. And um, who's that coach now? Oh, you got me there. I don't know off yeah, the top of my head. Allen uh, actually did a pretty good job initially because that program wasn't doing anything. And he did a pretty nice job. But, uh, yeah, that's one of the things that uh, um, could come into play. And, by the way, he had a really good year in 2022. 
his stats were much better. I have no idea if that was talent wise coaching or whatever. Cause last year I remember wondering why his stats weren't as good, but yeah, he, his, his, he had just, I mean, he was what, he was almost 70% on his completion percentage with a 25, four touchdown interception ratio. So um, I don't expect that at Indiana, but uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Not necessarily what he did last year. Okay. What we're going to do now is we are going to put uh, Dave to the test here because one Uh-oh. of his yeah one of his quarterbacks is Will Rogers, and Will Rogers. Speaking of transfers, Will Rogers uh, is uh, is is now. Uh, it's it's funny because Will Rogers basically went from the SEC. I thought I was going to the Pac-12, but you're really going to the Big Ten. So that's Will Rogers, uh, and. Uh, what we're going to do here is, is have a little bit of discussion and back and forth between Dave as he lets us know why he likes Will Rogers. And then Hayden is going to just step in when he wants to step in and uh, give his opinion on uh, why he thinks Dave is dead wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Why, why he uh, might have his own thoughts on, uh, on Rogers. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. I mean, every year, ever since that Brock Purdy pick that our lads predicted, by the way, in our draft guide back in 2023, um, you know, you start looking at these, these lists, the list of day three quarterbacks. And that's where I have real Will Rogers. I don't think it's going to get any better than that, but you look for a guy that say, Hey, he could be this year's Brock Purdy. We're probably going to talk about like that for the long time. Meaning a guy that is an NFL caliber prospect, but um, is kind of just a little on the downslope when it comes to actual physical talent and upside. And, but you look at how much football this kid has played and you look at some of his best tape, you say, Hey, I can see it. You know, if he gets put into the right system, I can see it. And that's what I see with Will Rogers. You know, four years at Mississippi State, 40 career starts. You know, this guy's going to enter the NFL with over 50 starts on his resume. And he walked away from that Mississippi State program with 29 school records. He, he wasn't just a guy there. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a dink and dunk passing game. You know, this is a kid that transferred to Washington. But then when DeBoer committed to Alabama, he entered the portal himself. Uh, because he was probably on some shaky ground, insecure about where he'd end up. Uh, but with Jed Fish taking over, who has NFL experience, he kind of you know took a U-turn and, and returned to Washington. And you know, if if we can get back to what he did in 2021, uh, I mean, that was one of the best seasons we've seen in SEC history: 4,687 yards, 36 touchdowns, nine interceptions. If you remember, post 2021, this was a kid that a lot of us were looking at as a future first round pick. Um, scheme was a big part of that production. And, you know, I'll be the first to tell you he's not the most talented, but that's, you know, give me some of the best names in the NFL at the quarterback position. It has less to do with talent and more to do with response to adversity, ball placement, and being able to play on time. And I think those are the traits that I see in Will Rogers that makes me think he's got a fighting chance at the next level. Hayden? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely agree with a lot of what Dave said. I mean, it's hard to find someone with a resume like Will Rogers, and not even just in terms of Mississippi State football, but SEC football in general. I believe he was second all-time in passing yards in the SEC, uh, 12,315 yards. He had 94 touchdowns as well. So if you're talking about a guy just from a resume standpoint, there's going to be few guys that match that. Threw the ball almost 2,000 times uh, at Mississippi State. Obviously played in an air raid offense for most of his career under a mastermind offensive coach and Mike Leach, rest his soul. Uh, this past year, we got to see a little bit more of a different style of offense. Not to say that they went away from the air raid. You still saw a lot of the dink and dunk plays that uh, they used in the air raid under Mike Leach. But they tried to stretch the field a little bit more uh, from what I saw. And I don't feel like Will Rogers' arm is strong enough to make a lot of those throws like deep downfield. Now you go to a school like Washington where they're going to have a new coaching staff, but you just look at last year's offense, a lot of Michael Penix throwing to, you know, Roma Dunze downfield, Jalen Polk, uh, McMillan, all those type of guys. They're definitely going to have to change the style of offense that they ran, at least from last year, which with the new coaching staff is certainly the direction that they're going to go in. Uh, Definitely very concerned about his arm strength in terms of talking about uh, a pro quarterback at the next level, made some questionable throws downfield, certainly a lot of good, Uh, He gets the ball out quick. He's very smart. Uh, He has really good accuracy at the short and intermediate. Uh, There's just some questions about getting the ball deep, which from an NFL quarterback, you're going to want to see. 
and we'll we'll see what he does. Uh, you know, in a new offense in Washington, away from an air raid, and I really feel like just looking at last year's offense uh, compared to what they did under Mike Leach, this is going to be a good fresh start for him. Sort of similar to the problem that Rattler has, right? Uh, not exactly because uh, I, I, you look at Rattler and you go, yeah, but the downfield passing game, if you don't have that at the next level, um, that's a big issue because you just can't. You can't not have a good passing downfield passing game in the NFL anymore. That's just not going to cook. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I'm just going to keep circling back to Brock Purdy. <laughs> you know, like it's – he doesn't have a big power arm. Um, I do think he's got more arm talent than, than Rodgers, I will say that, and so does Rattler. Uh, just in, If you're just evaluating the ability to throw the football – uh, those guys are a little bit cleaner there, but you know, in today's NFL where the, where the name of the game now is get the ball out and, and let these guys do some work after the catch. You might, I mean, if you told me 10 years ago, you have to be able to throw the ball downfield. I would agree. But I think with every year, I mean, the NFL is usually two to three years behind college football. And then the college football is usually four to five years behind high school. You know that these games are spreading these teams. Uh, these offenses are trying to spread everyone out, get the ball in the playmaker's hands. Um, and be a little less reliant on the high risk throws down the field. It it is nice to have that that weapon in in your arsenal to at least call on and keep defenses honest. But if you can excel and be elite underneath intermediate, that to me just it doesn't bother me as much as it would have been probably about a decade ago. Yeah, I guess that's the trick though, isn't it? Is is the because well, look, I mean, if you look at it statistically speaking, he doesn't have the numbers. Uh, I believe he's never been at at seven yards an attempt in his career. He's always mm -hmm. been in the high sixes. Yep. And top guys nowadays are in the nines. Um, but again, I see what you're saying, especially if you can be really accurate and you've yep. got great timing with your receivers based on the offense you run. Yep. That goes a long way. So. Yeah, I mean his his average depth of target. If you want to look at that, I mean you're you're right about his yards per attempt has never uh, gotten over seven. He was six point nine, six point eight, but yeah. he was seven point six average depth of target in twenty twenty three. And as Hayden said, they switched up the offense a little bit. The previous numbers were low sixes, you know, like okay. just just above five. So there was on average a little bit more air underneath those balls in twenty twenty three. And you know, I will say it wasn't his best football, you know. So sure. maybe that is proving Hayden right that maybe he doesn't have that ability to really be a downfield factor. But um, you know, he's just gonna be one of the more intriguing guys to watch yep. in this offense because it's it's the Washington offense will look nothing like it did a year ago. So that that alone is going to be pretty intriguing to watch. And then yeah, finally just bouncing off go ahead, Greg. No, go ahead, Hayden. I was just going to bounce off of Dave's idea there, just looking at the Washington offense, just compared to what it was last year. I mean, having a veteran quarterback in the room like Will Rogers that, like I talked about, has thrown the ball 2,000 times, has been a four-year starter for the mm -hmm. Mississippi State program. That's going to be super important for an offense that, I mean, is going to really lack experience. You look at the guys they had last year, obviously they lost Michael Penix. He was the eighth overall pick. They lost Dylan Johnson at running back. I know he went undrafted, but really talented player. Mm -hmm. Top three receivers uh, all got drafted. Top two tight ends went to the draft as well. Um, it's going to look, and as we talked about, the coaching staff all left. It's going to be a completely different team as they enter the Big Ten. Uh, totally new offense. Um, so I think having a quarterback like Will Rogers that's seen the field a lot, has a lot of experience, and might feel a little bit more comfortable is going to help them a lot. Well, he also gets Jed Fish, right? Yep. So that's that, that's a nice coach to work with in for one year. It's only probably going to be a year, right? Uh, he's down. He's out of eligibility. I yes, think. this will be his last year. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that, Jed Fish did a tremendous job at Arizona. I'm I'm I, I, Arizona fans devastated he left, uh, but that's another story, and that's a program we'll definitely be talking a lot of about this season. Um, okay, one more player I just want to throw out there: Cade McNamara. Now, Cade McNamara uh, had a big year, first year, basically starting for Michigan. They went to the playoffs, but then he saw the limitations in his game when he lost to Georgia in a playoff game. There's only so many things Cade McNamara can do. Uh, hence, J.J. McCarthy, they're in camp. They're going to battle. Cade saw the writing on the wall. Takes off of Iowa. Didn't get the chance this past year because he was injured. Hopefully he'll be able to play this year. What do you need to see in Cade McNamara's game? Because I, I guess he's got at least a couple more years of eligibility. So what do you need to see in Cade McNamara's game for you to be a true believer that he can actually be 
maybe even a mid-round draft pick. Sure, absolutely. I'll go ahead and start on sure. this one. Just looking at Cade McNamara from last season, he only played in a handful of games last year. The offense looked somewhat functional when he was on the field, at least a little bit. But after he went down with an injury, I mean, the offense, like I'm not going to sugarcoat it or anything, was totally like dysfunctional, totally abysmal. Having a veteran quarterback like McNamara, who's seen the field quite a bit, actually, uh, and I know he only completed about 50% of his passes from this past season, but having a guy that's been on the field, having a veteran presence in the room, I think is just going to help that offense out a lot. They just need a fresh, clean start. Uh, and having a veteran quarterback like him uh, is going to help them a lot. They're also going to be thrown to a really talented tight end. I know we always talk about those Iowa tight ends. Uh, they're going to have another this year that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the show that should take the pressure off of him just a little bit. Yeah, the, the little I have on him is, is, again, another guy that isn't really blessed with a lot of tools, but if we can see him perform under pressure a little bit better than he did last year, just his, his splits from pressure versus – uh, no pressure are significant. And as Hayden said earlier, to echo him, you know, how you respond to situations like that when you have guys bearing down on you in a tight pocket and you're going to have less time in the NFL to throw to, less space, more speed to throw against, you know, that's where I think he's going to have to take a step up. Uh, but like he said, I mean, that it was hard to watch get anything out of that Iowa offense last year. Um, but he does have some talent around him. And I do think it can only get better from what they put on the field in 2023. So if they do see a big improvement, you know, he's going to be a big part of it. Okay, and as we go to running back, just want to let everybody know, um, you might have uh, done your own research since uh, this came up, uh, or you might have known anyway, but uh, Kirk Signetti is the next uh, head coach at Indiana, and uh, he had a tremendous run at James Madison. Not a household name, but he could be a household name real soon if he can continue to coach the way that he's been coaching so far in his career. What a great job he did at James Madison. So now he has a, an interesting quarterback there to work with. Uh, wow. Indiana, is may, I, I think they're going to be a team to watch. I, I think there are some certain coaches like, like Leipold at Kansas. Uh, they're out there where they go to a program that just, eh, eh, it's Indiana. And then two or three years later, Indiana and all of a sudden is a relevant football program, uh, just like we're seeing at Kansas. So I think, I think Signetti can do that at Indiana. Okay. Uh, let's talk about running backs. And let's start off with a couple on the same team, Dave. Yeah. Uh, we just talked about Howard and, and the fact that this is going to be potentially more of a running offense first. And I can't imagine it won't be when you have Travion Henderson and now Quinshawn Judkins, uh, the old Miss transfer, the same backfield. Yeah. I mean, tale of two completely different backgrounds. And again, this is what I like to do this time of year. You know, Travion Henderson, who was on my radar last year, who's actually my RB1 at this time last year for the 2024 NFL draft. And um, he was he was the guy in the 2021 recruiting class, five-star recruit. His 1,248 yards were the second most by Ohio State freshman. His 19 TDs were the most by an Ohio State freshman. Just think about some of the names that have come through there. Um he was on a level of his own um, injuries are what really have kept him kind of out of that national true spotlight, both in 2022 and 2023 off the top of my head. I think he missed eight games over that span and he came back both times. These weren't season ending injuries, but they were annoying enough, nagging enough that it kept him off the field. And it kind of, you know, it makes you question, can he hold up at the next level? We, you know, a recent Ohio State back that has had a similar issue, J.K. Dobbins. You know, great back, but if you can't stay in the field, it just doesn't matter. And it's a high, it's a you know, it's a really volatile position because of this factor alone. Quinchon Jenkins, uh, very similar size. He was a three-star recruit. He wasn't very sought after, but what he did uh, as a freshman in the SEC had not been done since 1980. Herschel Walker, and you know, th th this is some of the stuff that. You know, it has to catch your attention. Now, in 2023, the bar was set so high. He didn't, he didn't play as well as you really wanted him to, but he still played well. And the fact that he's going to go to Ohio State, we're going to watch these guys play together. I mean, good luck trying to stop this running game. Um, you know, I, I like both of them because they don't fumble the football. I like both of them because they're big playbacks and they're both tough to get onto the ground. Those are the things that I look for. Can you be an explosive playmaker and can you get yards after contact? Both do that at a high level without putting the football on the turf. Uh, so really fun pair to watch. And by, I mean, there, I don't think there's a rushing duo in the in NCAA that can match what these guys are going to be putting on the field. Oh, what is the one trait though that separates them each? Just a little bit even. 
Uh, Henderson's a little more explosive. You know, I think he's got a little bit more get off, a little bit more juice once he reaches the open field. But Jenkins to me is a more natural runner. I, he's got a much better feel for space, better vision. If you want to put it that way. Um, he's got a little bit quicker speed, uh, meaning that he doesn't need a huge runway to get going where if Henderson gets into the open field, you're not going to catch him. But to me, there's just a little bit of tightness in his running style. And I think more it, I think it's less of a physical issue in his hips and lower body. I just think it doesn't have the feel. He's not always running on the heels of his offensive blockers and getting to the right angle like Blake Corum did at Michigan, for example. And he excelled in that area. And I think that's what he kind of misses out on a little bit. And some of it's just a lack of experience because of the injuries. So, uh, But I think Henderson is a better athlete. Uh, and Juggins, to me, is a better football player at this time. And a couple other running backs uh, uh, that you wanted to zero in on, Dave. Uh, Kyle Manungai from Rutgers, who led the Big Ten in rushing last uh, last season. And Jordan James from Oregon. Yeah, Manunga is a you know another kid that was a little overlooked in the recruiting process. The Ivy Leagues were going after him. Then all of a sudden, Rutgers, a hometown program, because he was a hometown kid in North Jersey. Um you know, special team defender in 2020. In 2021, he was the kid behind Isaiah Pacheco, number two guy. 2022, he takes a step up. He is number one league guy, but he wasn't anything special. 2023 was the breakout. Uh, he led the Big Ten in rushing. Um, it was him and just Blake Corum that were above 1,000 yards. Uh, Corum did it with two more games and 16 more carries. So on a per game, per rush basis, Menongo was a little bit uh, more efficient, a little bit more productive. Um, he was top five in power five in missed tackles force. He led the Big Ten by a mile. What I love about his game is the is the footwork, the contact balance, and the ability to forecast where defenders are going to go after him. He is he is a step ahead physically and mentally, and because he's such a because his footwork is so explosive and agile and balanced, he can make you miss. And you know those missed tackle numbers, they're real. You know it, it's a real number that he uh, he really earns the hard way. Um, He's not going to run through you. Not the biggest guy in the world. I think he's measured in at 5'9", 210, which is a you know a pretty typical size of a running back. Um, but he, he does have that next gear in the open field that if he does reach it, you're, you're going to have a hard time uh, getting him. And Jordan James, 5'10", 205. You know, these, these, I'm really curious to see how this Oregon rushing game, who has been so small guy dependent for so long, basically essentially since Royce Freeman was there uh, about almost 10 years ago, um, can, does that translate to Big Ten football? Because this is another undersized kid, not as small as Bucky Irving. Um, they have Noah Whittington there too, who missed some time last year, and these guys are going to share touches. Uh, but this was a kid that was wanted by everyone out of high school, um, SEC included. He starts off as their short yardage back. Imagine that, 5'10", yeah, 10, 5 under right. the power back. Um, in 2023, he was fourth in the country among backs with 100 carries with 7.1 yards per um, he's a big yard after contact guy. Another one that's just hard to square up. You know, he's very shifty, very late. He's a late mover, uh, meaning he lets the defense commit to how they're going to take him down. And he can kind of get in and around out of traffic. Um, but, you know, he's going to be sharing carries, like I said, with Winnington. And, you know, he had double digit carries just three times in 2023. So to me, not a huge deal, but he's a he's a committee guy. You know, he's not going to be a top 45 pick next year, but he's someone that that's the way the NFL works now. Get a committee of guys in the backfield and he can play multiple different roles and he plays bigger than his size would suggest. All right. Uh, Hayden, uh, Jaquavius Marks, uh, the transfer from Mississippi State. We're playing for USC, which means he's playing in the Big Ten this year. Uh, Marks is a name that I've heard of for the past few years. So uh, what do you like about him? Yeah, absolutely. Jaquavius Marks has been playing at Mississippi since the COVID year, since 2020. So he's been around college football for a little while. Even though you said USC, it's still going to take me a little bit a while to get used to calling that the Big Ten. I uh, always think of the Pac-12. But yes, USC uh, jumping on over to the Big Ten. Uh, like we talked about, he's going to be entering his fifth season of college football. Usually when you look at a running back with you know who's played five seasons of college football, you're usually looking at, okay, they probably have a lot of tread on the tires and you know, looking at the trends in the NFL currently, not a lot of running backs play very long, you know, past the age of 30 or get big contracts past the age of 30. But if you really break it down and look at his carries, he didn't carry the ball a whole lot, which might come as a surprise until you look at the offense that he played for. Uh, as we talked about when we were talking with Will Rogers, played in the air raid style offense where uh, rather than running the ball a whole lot, they're just going to try and dink it and duck it to a lot of their passing targets. So he didn't get a ton of carries uh, at Mississippi State. Um, this past season, he ended up getting 121 carries uh, for 573 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, and this was in the kind of new offense that 
uh, Mississippi State was running. But other than that, he didn't have a whole lot of uh, carries uh, on his resume. What he did do um, is he made the most out of his opportunities in terms of a pass catcher. Uh, he caught the ball a heck of a lot at uh, Mississippi State, 191 catches uh, in four seasons there throughout his career. He had 83 receptions in 2021 out of the backfield, which I thought was really impressive. Uh, and then this past season, he wasn't used quite as much in the passing game. He only had 23 receptions, so wasn't a huge factor in that. One of my favorite characteristics of him was certainly his tenacious blocking ability. He really wants to take your head off when he's coming to block you downfield, uh, whether that be uh, in pass protection, whether that be uh, blocking for the running back or for the quarterback in QB run game. Uh, he's really looking to open up lanes, and the way he's going to do that is by taking your head off. Uh, I think his patience in the backfield uh, was really solid. Uh, he had really good breakaway speed uh, when he was able to carry the ball, nice uh, stutter steps, uh, being able to cut – uh, upfield sharply making defenders miss um you'd really hope to see it you know a steady increase in production out of him uh during his four-year career at mississippi state we didn't really see that he's going to get a fresh start at usc so we're going to see if he can make the most out of his opportunity yeah, it sounds like uh he's got uh third down back written all over him yeah absolutely if you're looking for an ideal third down back he's I mean, almost as good as it gets Yeah. Uh, from that. I'm sure, you know, with their running back room, uh, they just lost their starting running back this past season, uh, Marshawn Lloyd. So they're going to be looking for that starting back. Um, for someone with as little carries as he has had, maybe he's someone that could step into that rotation, maybe come off as the starter uh, and get a few more carries to add onto his resume before he tries to go to the NFL. Okay. Uh, before you move on, uh, you wanted to also talk about Donovan Edwards. And this was a player that was not on Dave's list. So that's why we're going to, I think we'll call this segment the gauntlet because uh, Dave uh, threw the gauntlet down uh, on this one. Uh, and by the way, Donovan Edwards is the player I'm trying to uh, interview. So hopefully we'll get oh, him nice. on soon. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, if, all, if all works out. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so go ahead, Hayden. Um, Cause me as a Michigan fan, um, I kind of see both of your sides, even though uh, I haven't heard it yet, but I, I know I'm going to, I think I know what I'm going to get here. Uh, so go get started, Hayden. Donovan Edwards. Yeah, absolutely. Donovan Edwards. Uh, some people, especially the younger generation might know him as the cover athlete on NCAA 25. <laughs> that's coming out uh, in a couple months here. Uh, but he did play a big part for Michigan's backfield over the past uh, couple years, uh, especially in 2022. Uh, started to take a few of Blake Corum's reps, really started to become you know, one of the focal points of their running game, of their offense. Um, I was really expecting to see kind of a step up in production uh, this past season. Really, most of the carries uh, went to Blake Corum. They also introduced a running back number 20. I'm not 100% familiar with his name, uh, but ended up taking some of Donovan Edwards' reps as well. But um, if you go and look at his film, I thought the film looked nice. Um, uh, looking from a statistics standpoint, he averaged 7.1 yards per carry in 2022, which is super nice. Uh, last season, he only had 497 yards and five touchdowns, only got 119 carries last season. Uh, still got 30 catches for 250 yards as well. Um, I did want to pull out this fun fact that I'm probably sure that even you as a Michigan fan might not know, but he has thrown a pass in all three seasons for Michigan and completed all three of them. He's three for three in his career as a passer for 108 yards and a touchdown. So if you're a team at the end of the season, and Donovan Edwards hasn't thrown a pass yet, you probably should look out for that maybe against your team. Uh, now, watching his tape, um, I ended up pulling up the Nebraska game uh, from this past season. Uh, he had 14 carries in that game, which was the most that he had all of last season. Thought he had a really good burst when hitting the gap. Uh, attacks defenders with power. He's going to be a guy that's going to pick up uh, yards after contact. As I talked about with his uh, receiving uh, pedigree, he's going to be a viable receiving threat in the passing game, which for the next level at the NFL level is something that you're going to be looking for out of your running back. Um, there's a couple of things that I would like to see him improve on. Number one, first and foremost, would be to scrape a little bit tighter to his offensive lineman. feel like he got a little bit wide on his tracks. Uh, if he got scrapes a little bit tighter, I think it's going to allow him to force uh, a few more missed tackles. Um, thought he also had solid speed. I wouldn't say it was game breaking, but uh allowed some defenders to catch up to him, especially when getting out on the perimeter to the sideline. But I think entering this year, he's going to be the focal point of their running game. Blake Corum's gone now. It's going to be the Donovan Edwards show, and I think he's someone that could really see their stock rise this year. Dave, do you? Uh, what is your biggest uh, worry about whether or not he is going to have what it takes to be 
the bell cow. I don't know if he can ever be that. I don't even know if he's going to be able to be the bell cow I, 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 this year, to tell you the truth. Uh, but you tell me. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the knee, to be honest with you. You know, he, he what's impressive about him is actually the one that is the thing that worries me the most about him was that that really big 2022 te- uh, season that he uh, that Hayden talked about, 7.1 yards per carry, just under 1,000 yards um, in, in that kind of Batman Robin backfield when he took over for Blake Coleman when he went down. I mean, he was excellent, dominant. and But he played that year with a partially torn patellar tendon. And coming from someone that knows a lot about, you know, personally about knee issues, and and that that's a that's a bad one. I'd rather take my ACL twice and than deal with a patellar tendon issue. Um, and he had a surgery in February this past, so February 2023, and I could tell in 2024 there there he kind of lacked some of that gear. And I don't hold that against him. It can take over a year to really recover from a surgery like that, but. I want to see it before I can put his name next to, you know, one of being the top, top back in this conference or even one of the top guys. I mean, this running back group, take out the big 10 nationally guys. It is going to be a lot better than what we saw last year. Um, we didn't have, we might even see a couple first round backs in, in the 2025 draft, uh, similar to what we saw last year, not this past draft. Uh, but is he that, in the that's, right system. Yeah. Is, is Donovan Edwards in the right system? What system yeah. would be best for Donovan Edwards to run behind? I mean, I love him. Like, like Caden, uh, sorry, like Hayden said. Uh, sorry, my, I have a nephew named Caden. Hayden. I always want to call you that, but the, uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to make a dig at you uh, here. That we're supposed to d- debate Donovan Edwards on on live TV here, but um, you know, he he to me, he's more of a gap guy. You know, you could see in the Washington in the Washington tape, six carries, 104 yards. Um, like like uh, Hayden said, he doesn't have the feel to kind of just fill out the defense and have forecasted vision and running really tight to the hips of the blockers. Uh, but you tell him where to go, you know, hit the hole hard, let him use that 210 pound frame with good burst. Um, he'll do damage. And like you said, his yard after contact numbers, they weren't good in 2023, but I do think some of that was, he was still recovering from that injury. So if you put him to a gap controlled scheme and just essentially for lack of better terms, tell him where to go and just tell him to run hard, put his head down. Um, if he reaches the open field, he'll get away from guys. Uh, his calling card to me is going to be less about his running scheme and his running style is going to be what he can do as a pass catcher. Um, he's been a really good receiver all three yeah. years. And I think that's where he's, he's going to make his money at the next level. But to me, you know, that unless you're Jameer Gibbs type athletic ability and ability to run with the football in your hands in the running game. Um, I, I think that's more of like a, a round three, round four area type back. If you're going to draft him to simply uh, catch the football or as Hayden said, throw the football once a year. <laughs> yeah. Well, even if he ends up being a compliment, like he was to quorum in the NFL, I think right. that's going to be a good compliment because maybe that's his role is you let maybe the power guy do his business and the team, the defense is used to that power guy. And all of a sudden it goes Donovan and he's going to do something. The power guy can't do that. You weren't expecting because he's got that burst and yeah. all of a sudden, boom, he's gone. And that's what he's, yeah. that's what he did the last couple of years for Michigan. Yeah. I mean, as, as Jameer Gibbs was thriving in the NFL, you know, I remember watching tape at this time last year and this is after the surgery. So you still didn't know what, what Edwards would be. Um, I did throw the name Jameer Gibbs out in the air just in terms of like running soft fluidity and the ability to impact the passing game. I don't think he's going to grade out nearly as high as Gibbs did. I think I had Gibbs as a top 10 player on my board when he came out of Alabama, but I do think he can be in that kind of role and he thrived in that David Montgomery compliment role. That's where I think Edwards could do well. Yep. Absolutely. Good comparison. All right. uh, Let's talk about these receivers. Uh, We've got about 10 minutes uh, left. So, um, First, uh, we've got oh another Ohio State uh, player. We've got Ibuka from Ohio State. Uh, big surprise, another elite uh, wide receiver coming out of there. Also, uh, Dave, uh, you've got Tez Johnson from Oregon. And uh, let's just talk about those two guys, uh, sure. Tez Johnson and Ibuka. How high can Ibuka go in this year, in next year's draft? Yeah, I mean, give me a wide receiver that has been developing under wide receiver coach Brian Hartline, uh, Brian Hartline any day. I mean, this guy knows how to breed NFL. He's had four first round talents put into, into the NFL the past three years. This kid was in line to be the next one, but injuries slowed him down this past year. Um, he's earned all Big Ten honors all three seasons, both as a receiver, or so I should say, as a receiver and or as a returner. So again, we keep bringing this up. The return game has extra value now. And if you have proven success as a returner, I hope he gets a few more looks here in 2024. 
that's going to increase. That could break a few ties, right? If you have receivers, especially at that position now, there's just so many guys that you group together. If someone has legitimate game-changing return ability, uh, that could give him that boost. Um, you know, his skill set revolves around, revolves around just snappy movement in and out of his breaks, reliable hands. He's an inside-outside threat. He's a thick kid, too. He weighs over 200 pounds. He could break tackles. Um you know, there's just some, sometimes you just have to kind of wait your turn. And now that they have this new freshman Smith coming in, he might be the headline guy, but you know, if this kid comes out and puts together another all 10, you know, all big 10 conference type of year, it's really hard to deny the fact that he at the very least is going to be a very, you know, a solid receiver at the next level. Everything about his game looks NFL ready. Tez Johnson is, is the gamble that I put on the sheet five foot 10, 160. You know, you're almost off the radar light at that point. Um, he's going to enter this process as my number two or number three slot receiver nationally. Um, and he, he was, again, not very highly recruited, started off at Troy 2020 to 2022 is, is where he played there. But in power five um, yards per route run, that's a stat I kind of like to keep an eye on. I don't like to be victim to numbers, but this time of year, I do pay attention just to kind of get these guys on the sheet. Um, it was basically he was in the same tier as Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison, Troy Franklin, Luther Burden, Javon Baker, Trey Harris. Xavier Leggett, Malik Washington, all NFL receivers. And that's where Tez Johnson's production on a per snap basis, on a per route basis is lining up with. Here's the one thing, but his it, this is the one thing that really stands out to me at 5'10", 160, 22 missed tackles forced. All right. Marvin Harrison had five, for example. <laughs> This kid is Xavier Worthy type toughness. And that's, you know, I talked about Xavier Worthy as a first rounder for an entire year. And everyone said, oh, the size, the size, he's tough. And it, how does he, how does he compare to Tank Dell? I would, it's actually a pretty good comparison. Um, I think he's got a little bit more fluidity. You know, Dell to me was just more, more of a grinder. He was a tough kid. That's why they called him Tank, just a yeah. tough kid. Uh, he's a little bit better of a return specialist as well. I think Tez has a little bit more fluidity as a route runner and his ball skills look a little cleaner as well. So this is a kid I'm really intrigued to watch here in 2024. And by the way, Ekbuka, is he three? And in, 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 if we're going to compare Harrison and Wilson, is he three on that list? Um, well, I would put a lot in front wise. of him as well. Yeah, I would, say he's a, yes. I would say he's a notch below those guys. So those guys four, were all top 15 the, picks. Okay. I think he's more of like a, a you know 25 to 35 type pick. And when you're talking about overall. Okay. And um, uh, Hayden, uh, you have a couple of transfers you wanted to quickly talk about. Uh, Demir Miller, uh, Rutgers gets uh, an FCS uh, star, uh, and they needed it for sure. And Elijah Surratt, uh, we just talked about uh, Indiana. Uh, and by the way, where did he come from? James Madison. Uh, big surprise where Signetti was. So talk about those two, uh, those two transfers. Yeah, funny. I forgot about Signetti when I was just talking about the receiver that transferred with him. I'm going to start off with Dimir Miller uh, from Rutgers. Uh, he's a transfer from Monmouth, so at FCS school. Uh, he owns a lot of their receiving records. Last season, he broke the single season receiving yards records and receptions records uh, and yards in a game. Against New Hampshire last year, he had 333 yards in the game. Uh, he also led the FCS in receiving yards last season. So if you're looking for someone with a resume, to bump up to the Power 5 level, he's definitely going to be one of those guys. He was a team captain, first team All-American, second in the countries in receptions. I mean, the accolades go on and on and on. He's listed at 6'8", 180 pounds. He's also going to be one of the fastest players in all of college football. He's got tremendous speed as a deep threat, especially out of the slot. He's got excellent ball tracking ability. Quick to sit down on his routes and turn around for the ball. Uh, there's you, you just go on and on and on. There's so much that I love about his game. I feel like he's gonna walk into Rutgers and be able to get in that lineup immediately and you know be a presence on the field for them. Uh, he never really got pressed up in the games that I saw. So when you're jumping to the Big Ten, he's probably gonna get pressed up a little bit more. Played a little bit outside for him, which is where you would probably expect to see him get pressed up a little bit more. Um, and I feel like he needs to be a little bit more creative on his release to set up his routes just a little bit better. Uh, switching over to Surratt from Indiana, as we talked about, he was a transfer from James Madison, had a tremendous season last year. And then before then, in 2022, he played for St. Francis. Um, he's going to be a true junior this season, so he might not be someone that comes out this year. But, you know, we might be able to come back and, you know, uh, you know, talk about him for the next couple of years. He was an honorable mention All-American, first team All-Sun Belt. Uh, and he was voted as the team MVP 
of the last season. I wrote this down, and I think this is one of the biggest notes that describes him. He's going to be a quarterback's best friend. He's really good at finding holes in coverage, uh, alerting his quarterbacks to some easy throws, adjust his routes, making easier throws for the quarterback. He's smooth on hitches and curls, comes back for the football. He just is going to make everything easier on the quarterback. Uh, that Rutgers is bringing in this year uh, transfer from the transfer portal, excuse me, against UConn. He had a really impressive double move, really showed off uh, his uh, big playability with an incredible, spectacular catch. Lots of yards after the catch. His route tree was a lot of slants, hitches, quick outs. Um, so he was someone that was able to get out into the open field and uh, make some plays. Definitely needs to get better as a blocker. There were some points last season, especially on crack blocks, uh, where I didn't see 100% effort from him and allowed some players to get tackled on the sideline because he didn't make those blocks. But I think he's going to be an interesting receiver to keep an eye on this year. All right, guys. So uh, we have one more receiver to go before we uh, head off to tight ends and the offensive line. And that's a receiver that Hayden wanted to talk about, Evan Stewart, the transfer. Uh, and uh, Evan Stewart, uh, going from Texas A&M to Oregon. So now he's a part of the Big Ten, not the Pac-12. Uh, that's going to be an old uh, uh, kind of deal. Uh, if we keep saying that uh, for the next four months. But anyway, uh, let's talk about Evan Stewart, Hayden, uh, because uh, obviously the kid's got talent. Uh, he's changed teams. Uh, what do you like about him? What do you think? Because, uh, look, Oregon, we've already talked about one of their uh, weapons uh, matter of fact, uh, that was a, a receiver, Tez Johnson, another transfer that Dave liked. Uh, but this is a guy that you like, and then we'll find out what Dave thinks uh, when uh, he puts in his, uh, uh, you know, his analysis. So go ahead, tell us what you like about Evan Stewart. Yeah, just starting off with a little bit of background, background excuse me, and just kind of presenting the picture. I think Oregon's passing offense this year is going to be really interesting to watch. Like you had mentioned, Tez Johnson. Uh, Evan Stewart entering the uh, the receiving room. It's going to be an interesting room to watch for sure. Evan Stewart, he's a transfer from uh, Texas A&M. He was very highly re uh, regarded recruit out of high school. Uh, he was a number one wide receiver in his class coming out. Uh, played the past two seasons, like I said, at Texas A&M. Didn't really see the jump in production that you were looking for, but the talent was definitely uh, there. Uh, he's listed at six foot, 175 pounds. Uh, his best game of the season came last year against Miami, which I've only watched one game on him. Uh, that was the game that I chose to watch. Uh, thought he was dynamic with the balls, or excuse me, dynamic with the ball in his hands. Uh, showed quick twitch. He had good change of direction skills. Good snap on in breaking routes. He's really physical at the catch point. You can definitely see that the talent's there. I just think he needs to put some things together before he can really take the next step as a wide receiver. I think he definitely needs to polish his route running. Uh, there were some routes that he kind of rounded off, some routes where he didn't really get great separation, and it really limited his ability to separate from defensive backs and to take the next step uh, in the Oregon offense. Um, he's going to have to be able to polish his route running just a little bit better. Well, actually, that's going to be a pretty small room, isn't it, Dave? Uh, uh, because uh, the, the receiver you talked about, Tez, he's a lot smaller but they're both kind of small. Yeah. I mean, Ted's 5'10, 160. Uh, the measurement I have on Stewart is six foot 175. So you average out those two weights. You're not going to find a smaller pair of top notch receivers it's just in terms of, of weight, right? Uh, height, not terrible. We've seen worse, but percentiles, they're both going to be, you know, bottom quarter, bottom third, uh, which is not the end of the world. I think every year we go through the same discussion. We talked about Xavier Worthy last year, Tank Dell the year before. The game is different now. Um, I don't think being big and physical is as, valu is as valuable as it was a few years ago. So I don't really – I'm not going to really use that against Evan Stewart. My issue with him is twofold. He He's not a physical guy at all. He doesn't do much after the catch. He doesn't break tackles. He does play a little soft. And I do think there's an issue with his hands. Uh, I don't think he's a natural pass catcher. He will make the spectacular catch over his shoulder on the move. Um, he gets open at all three levels uh, in, in multiple different ways as a route runner. But when you're talking about the consistency with his hands, and as Hayden has alluded to, the consistency with his route running, it's just not there yet. The town is undoubted. I think he was a top five-star recruit, maybe the number one receiver uh, recruit out of the country and he has flashed enough to say this guy is a real talent um, I do see at his best I see a Garrett Wilson type receiver out of him 
Um, wow. Just with how elegant he can move, how explosive, how smooth, how balanced he is. Um, but unlike Garrett Wilson, it's not has not translated to a full blown skill set yet. He has the talent, but I don't think he has the skill set yet to be considered a top notch guy. But a lot can change in a year of oh, college yeah. football. Well, this is uh, this is sort of like uh, uh, you know this is that transition type year for him where yeah. I think he he must know what he needs to do to improve uh, at the next level. And so this is it. This is his shot, and we'll see if we can take advantage of it. And and by the way, the other thing too that we have to keep an eye on that you got these Pac-12 kids again. Not all of them are Pac-12. We got transfers and so forth, but they're not playing in the Pac-12. They're playing in the Big Ten. So when they play on the road in the Big Ten, more than likely the weather's going to come into play. It's going to be colder, and so we'll get a real good idea. And that's a good thing for the development. And and I'm sure the scouts love that because they get to see what these kids look like in in real NFL type atmospheres as opposed to playing you know, and, and the luxury of the Pac-12 and usually the weather's nice and the defense isn't as good. So this yeah. is an advantage for these kids. Absolutely. It's going to open doors. And, you know, another thing, Stewart was a little banged up last year. I think he fought through a couple of nagging injuries. He missed a few games. So again, the, the, the baseline is there. I mean, I'm with Hayden. If this kid does put it together, he, we're going to be talking about him as one of the top five receivers next year. No question. Um, it's just a matter of him actually putting it together and rising to the occasion in the Big Ten. All right, we've got three uh, top tight ends to talk about now. And let's start with the one who could be the top tight end prospect in the nation, Colston Loveland from Michigan. And uh, especially if you're coming from Michigan and you're a tight end, um, I know the, regime, the, the Harbaugh uh, staff is gone, but still Michigan, they've, they've got loads of tight end prospects for years. And, uh, yeah, I look back at all of them as a fan and, and I can say that he, he looks like he could be one of the best that they've had because he's been doing it already at this stage of his career. Uh, so talk about uh, what kind of a ceiling this kid has, Dave. Yeah, I mean, definitely tight end one for me going into the season. Again, I don't like being, you know, putting that in, in concrete or putting it in pen right now. It's in pencil. Uh, but he's going to turn 21 just a couple of weeks before the 2025 draft. So you're talking about a young kid that's 6'6", 245 already. So you have to just – kind of use some historic historical data there and say this kid's probably going to play at 255 plus at the next level. Um, uh, all state awesome. basketball player in high school. You love to see that in general and scouting at this point of the process, get some background information on these kids and know that they're more than just a good football player. Um, he's a really well-balanced athlete, especially for the tight end position. That means a lot to me because of what the roles in which they have to do catching the ball in traffic and getting open despite playing against guys that are a bit quicker than them. Um, and knowing how to use their bodies. And, you know, this is a kid that broke out towards the end of the 2022 season. He was playing behind, if you remember, Luke Schoonmaker, who ended up being a second-round pick to Dallas. Um, but towards the end of that year is when he started to really show what he could do in 2023 in a run-based offense. Um, he was third in the countries, third in the country in yards per route run for the tight ends. And in the power five, he was only behind Brock Bowers. So this is a kid that was maybe didn't get enough looks compared to some of these high octane yeah. uh, pass the ball 50 times a game type offenses, but the opportunities he did have, uh, he took, he took advantage of it. So, and then, so that production is there, but the eyeball test route running uh, the feel for, for vacant zones and against, against coverage and the ability to see the ball in and do something after the catch, all of it's there. He just needs to clean up the drops. His drop rate is a little too high right now. Okay. Is he an all around tight end or is he, uh, you know, he's the new tight end, you know, he's not necessarily going to do much for you in the blocking game. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, most of the big tight ends in the NFL right now are probably 70, 30 receiving bias to blocking. Right. So he's by no means a 50, 50 guy. Um, and he's probably current state 80, 20 receiving bias, uh, meaning his, his blocking isn't there, but I'll tell you what, you don't play in that offense <laughs> without having some ability to block or at least some desire to block, right? To me, it's all about want to, do yeah. you want to block? And then we can coach everything else up. And again, the kid's going to get bigger and stronger. He's 20 years old right now. So um, I, I, that's not going to deter me at all from taking him in the first round if everything else checks out. And then the other uh, uh, tight end you wanted to talk about, Tyler Warren. So yeah. he's from Penn State. And it's interesting because you take a look, he is the, the leading returning receiver for Penn State. Yeah. Yeah. Transfers. We'll see how that works out. But still uh, on the team last year. But Theo Johnson, 
he actually uh, outproduced Theo Johnson just a little mm -hmm. bit statistically. They were pretty even. But what does that say about Warren? And how does he compare to Theo Johnson? Different tight end? Different tight end, yes. And in, in a way that we just talked about with, with Loveland, this kid is probably close to a 50-50 split. I mean, this guy can block. He blocks his butt off. They do a lot with him as a blocker in motion, in line. Um, he can get after guys in the in space at the second level. He can hold the point against a defensive end. He, I've even seen him win one-on-one -on -one battles against defensive tackles, guys that weigh 40 pounds, 50 pounds heavier than him. Um, he's, a, he's a strong, heavy-handed kid with great bend. Um, former high school quarterback and accomplished basketball player in high school as well. Um, I think he has the most NFL ready skill set of the guys, A, in this conference, but B, if you ask me to give you the top five tight ends as of right now, I think he is most NFL ready. I think this kid's going to be a stud at the next level. I loved Theo Johnson last year, but this kid was the best tight end on that football team. Draft round right about what, second then? I would say he's going to be in that early day two tier. Um, okay. And if he tests out athletically well, which I'm not sure if he will, he could sneak into the end of round one. But I think day two is is no brainer right now. So is this a surprise? Not when we're talking about Big Ten tight ends and we have three of them on the list and we are going to go through Michigan, Penn State and Iowa. I mean, big <laughs> shock if you're talking about uh, the tight end factories uh, in the Big Ten, let alone in college football, these three are at the top. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Lachey, that sounds familiar, uh, Hayden. Uh, Lachey, uh, we, we, we kind of remember that name from years past, but uh, he is looking to break out for Iowa because he was supposed to break out last year. But unfortunately, like most of the other key players on offense, they did not get a chance to uh, end the season the way they began it because they had just a rash of injuries. And Lachey was one of them. Yeah, absolutely. You might remember Lachey uh, from Jim Lachey. He actually comes from a football family. Uh, his father was a, a tackle for Washington, won a Super Bowl. Uh, he was a four-time NFL All-Pro, so a heck of a player for sure. But obviously when you talk about, like you alluded to, the tight end use, quote-unquote, for, you know, per se, in, uh, in college football, I was definitely going to be one of the top ones that comes up. You look at some of the names that they produced. Uh, Dallas Clark, who just got announced he's going to enter the Colts Ring of Honor, is coming up soon. Uh, George Kittle, TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant. Uh, just last year they had Sam Laporta come out. He was in the conversation for Rookie of the Year, definitely one of the better tight ends in the NFL this past season. And then this past year they also had Eric All uh, as well, um, who played alongside of Lachey uh, until Lachey's injury. So it was natural for me to want to look at the Iowa tight ends. Uh, so – Wanted to take a look at Lachey. He's going to be a fifth-year senior this year, um, listed at six foot six, two hundred and fifty-three pounds. Um, like we talked about, suffered a season-ending in season-ending injury in week three of last season, so didn't really get to see an extensive look at him from last season. So it's more of what we're looking for this year from a play type style or standpoint. Excuse me, he actually does remind me a lot uh, of Sam Laporta, um, the way that he plays, he's really strong at the point of attack as a blocker. Uh, you've even seen him a couple times on films, really uproot and drive edge defenders off the line of scrimmage, uh, really good at leveraging second level defenders, uh, arc releases, down blocks, whatever it may be. Just so on when you watch his film you can say he really takes pride as a blocker. He's someone that really wants to dominate you as a blocker, uh, has a fluid release off the line of scrimmage, makes good grounds on his initial, uh, strides, uh, loose hips underneath. He changes direction quickly. Good speed allows him to pick up solid yards after contact. Uh, I definitely expect that he's going to be one of the first tight ends off the board uh, in this year's class. Maybe not the first, but he's definitely going to be in that conversation. So it sounds like to me, but I, mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. It sounds like to me that he's a more advanced blocker than Laporta. I'd say so, yes, in terms of when Laporta came out. I'd say he's definitely more of an advanced blocker. Now, I think from a receiving standpoint, he's going to give you somewhat of similar production uh, as Laporta. Maybe not quite as fast as Laporta, but the way that they play, just in terms of being smooth route runner, like we talked about, getting off the line of scrimmage, it reminds me a lot of him. And, and, and who knows, maybe there was a good thing that he got injured. In a way, you could look at it on a positive side, because I don't know what his numbers still would have been if uh, with, with McNamara going down. So now McNamara is back with him. So you, the numbers are going to be a lot better. So again, look, I don't know if that would have, it, it, I don't know what it would have done to his draft stock, but you got to look at the bright side of things. Okay. Um, another tight end I wanted to throw out there before we go to offensive line is Jake, uh, Jack Velling 
from Michigan State, a transfer from Oregon State, because he's one of these guys that's more like, I mean, no, where, like, who's this guy? Where did he come from? Uh, and that's and, and, and it's not just the, t- the, touch, the touchdowns. He, he led, I believe, all tight ends and touchdowns with eight. Uh, playing with Jonathan Smith at Oregon State, but he also had 13 catches of 15 yards or more. So that combination is uh, – that's what intrigued me about wanting to throw his name into the mix and get your guys uh, just quick opinions on him. I don't know if you have any, but if you if you do, you can let me know. If not, we can move on to offensive line. But, yeah, that's just a guy that I think uh, we should definitely look out for since he's going to, I would imagine, be a pretty big part of the switch uh, to Michigan State. And I believe Michigan State is actually going to be a lot better than people think because uh, Jonathan Smith's a heck of a coach. They've had a lot of good transfers already transfer over to the program. Um, and uh, Velling's one of them. Yeah, I mean, Velling's coming from that Oregon State program. I know Michigan State now that they've been producing some quality tight ends over the past few years between Musgrave and the kid that the name slipped in my mind that went to Houston a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, it slipped um, your mind probably because it's hard to pronounce. Yeah, it was a long one. It was a long <laughs> yeah. one. I, remember, I remember scouting him up. He's a basketball background as well. He has a couple years of eligibility left, so I don't know if I see enough talent to say, hey, this kid is definitely going to be coming out in 2025. But he's definitely worth looking at early in the year. Uh, the yards per catch are definitely something that kind of are, are noteworthy. And I need to see more to see if right, is this speed, is this scheme? Uh, because there's it's not a ton of production on tape. You know, it's just more big plays. And it's really only kind of like a one year, you know, real kind of noteworthy uh, stat line. But, you know, some of these guys, I mean, this is good to talk about this at this point in the process. We're so we're so early in the scouting process for next year's class. This can kind of bring up the discussion because you have Velling and maybe 100 guys in the same similar situation saying, hey, this is a future NFL football player. But he's an underclassman. So unless this guy is, I remember Dan Shanka always telling me, unless the guy is a no doubt going to come out next year, let's not put too much attention on him just yet. And Velling is a guy that you had to look at because as we're preparing for this, right, we're like, who are the Big Ten tight ends? And he's got to be one of the names that you mentioned. But, you know, how much work do you do on a guy if you're not really sure if he's going to come out? So you kind of look at the stat lines, you see. All right, are there a couple of noteworthy plays like what you just said about the 15 plus yard receptions? You look at the program he's coming from. Did he block? Did he receive? Where did he line up? Um, and then if you have time, so Velling, I don't have much on him, and I would probably have a little bit more on him come August or September. But a lot of these guys are you just kind of have to wait and see. Yeah, that's why I, I try to say at the beginning of each of these videos that uh, this is not just about the 2025 draft. A lot right. of it has to do about it, but also it helps that we can kind of uh, preview the conference yep. and give you a, an idea of who are the interesting uh, players to keep an eye on that could make an impact this season. Okay, um, now we move over to offensive line, and I noticed that you have uh, three linemen you wanted to zero in on, Dave, and two of them uh, actually have partners that uh, that I want to throw in there because you, you wanted to talk about uh, Cornelius from Oregon and Jackson from Ohio State, and, um, and I also wanted your take on their teammates because Oregon uh, has actually a pretty good tandem. They have Connerly as well. And uh, Seth McLaughlin, McLaughlin, excuse me, is going from Alabama to Ohio State. And we know what kind of uh, snap problems he had last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully the kid gets, uh, gets, gets rid of that. But uh, he's a talented kid, and uh, we'll see how things work out for him at Ohio State. But let's talk, of course, about the two players that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, uh, Cornelius, six foot five, three ten. He's super long. He started off at Rhode Island. He played there from 2020 to 2022. A uh, little bit of guard, but mostly a right tackle. Levels up to the Pac-12 in 2023. 2.1 pressure rate allowed. That is the best among returning Power 5 offensive tackles. So every single school in the Power 5, he has the best pressure rate allowed. Now, part of that, you have to say, is Bo Nix got the ball out super fast. So I know that, that again, this is why offensive line statistics in general, you have to take them with a grain of salt. But this at this point last year and all of 2023 season, I was scouting him as if he was going to come out. Um, so I saw a lot of him. And there is some ugly tape. There's some ugly bend with his lower body. He does tend to hinge and lean from the waist and overset at times. But this guy is massive, and he's a good athlete. Um, he's a competitor. 
He fights hard. One of the traits I look for in offensive line is their ability to recover. You're not going to win off the snap all the time. You're going to lose inside hand position often, especially in the NFL, but you have to be able to recover. And he shows those recovery tactics at a high level. So those are things that I like a lot. I'd like to see him clean up the penalties. He's been flagged 19 times over the past two years. That is way too high. That is Tyler Smith territory uh, who, you know, panned out for the Cowboys, but that's something that, you don't see a number that high, uh, usually with, with half those snaps coming from Rhode Island. Um, but yeah, he, he's a better athlete than I thought he would be. He just It doesn't always look the way I want it to look, but neither did Joe Alt. So um, as long as you don't get beat and you're a good athlete and you know how to recover, you have a fighting chance. By the way, another thing with Lan- with uh, Oregon, and this is uh, going to be interesting to see how these kids de- develop because Lanning, we, we know what a great recruiter he is, yeah. which is why he got the job. Now, I know... It's probably too early. I would guess maybe next year we'll start to see some of his freshmen that he first recruited at Oregon that'll start to develop, and we'll see. So my point is, is that I think it'll it, it'll be interesting to, to keep an eye on on Oregon's talent coming out in the next couple of years uh, because you would think that they're and they were high before, but you would think that they'd even be more nationally ranked higher now based on his recruiting acumen. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it's like the NFL. You got to get these, some of these programs, these coaches, two, three, four years to kind of get their culture, get their guys in the transfer portal can in some ways can actually block the path of, of these guys that they recruited in the past, because it's just so, you know, you, you never know what's coming through the door if you're a college football player. So, uh, but Oregon, I mean, we're going to keep talking about them. I think they're, the team that can contend with Ohio State and Big Ten this year. Uh, there's there's talent everywhere on that team. And speaking of Ohio State, again, like I said, McLaughlin goes from Alabama to Ohio State as a center. But the guy that you wanted to talk about, Donovan Jackson. So Donovan Jackson, I mean, this guy uh, has been a, a top recruit. Um, and d- do you think that this is the season that – he really needs to break out because he could break out. And if, and if Ohio State's going to have a successful season, he's got to be a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, this is a kid that at this time last year, again, preliminary research, I was, I had, I think I put him in my top 32 overall saying this kid could have been a first round pick, but I mean, two games into the last season, I said, this guy doesn't even look like a draft pick at some point. I mean, he is huge. Six foot four, three twenty. His hands are big and strong. He plays long. Um, when he gets his hands and he's in a good position, he has dominant traits to him, especially in the run game. Uh, but you know, you, you can't you can't let these preconceived biases control what your evaluation is. And Jackson, to me, is maybe not the best guard in the conference, but he's one of the most interesting because I think when he puts it all together, his tape is as dominant as any offensive lineman in this conference. Um, but the inconsistency is maddening. Uh, he oversets way too often. He loses control at the second level. His pass protection is really hit or miss. And it seems like he's guessing out there rather than reacting. So that can come with experience. You know, you don't want to write him off yet. He's got talents that some of these other guys won't ever touch. And, um, you know, there, I, I've been, I've made this mistake a few times that you you look, give a guy an initial look. He has a couple bad games and you write him off. And, you know, that's just not that's not the right thing to do in evaluation. So he's one of the guys I'm going to zero in on early in the year and hope to see some improvements from 2023. And and we'll find out what kind of scheme changes they have on offense, too, because as we talked about with the quarterback situation, you, you just believe they're going to run the ball more. And that's a better uh, situation for offensive linemen, um, which, again, maybe this is a step that they're going to start taking at Ohio State, sort of like the way Michigan said, how do we beat Ohio State? Well, Ohio State has to counter and say, well, maybe we need to get more physical in the trenches. Maybe we need to control the line of scrimmage, run the football more. So uh, that could help Jackson as well. Okay. Uh, I want to get back to you, Dave, but uh, Hayden has uh, been patiently waiting, so I'm going to throw him in here with Gus Hartwig out of Purdue. What do you like about Gus Hartwig? Yeah, absolutely. There's a like a lot to like about Gus Hardwick. Excuse me. Uh, he's been a starter for uh, for Purdue since his true freshman season in 2020, and he's really been the anchor of the group since 2021. So over the past three seasons, uh, I pulled this statistic from the Purdue website that I thought was really interesting. He is the first true freshman to start on Purdue's offensive line since 2008. Uh, so it's been a long time since they had a true freshman start, and he was the first one to do it. And uh, over a decade. Uh, he's a three-time All Big Ten honorable mention, so I'm sure he's going to be hungry to, you know, get onto the actual list this year. Now, when you're looking for centers, you want someone that has a lot of 
experience under their belt. They're often going to be uh, the lineman that's asked to identify the front, adjust to protection, whatever it may be. And you really want to see if there's someone that can handle it. Uh, like I said, he has 39 games under his belt, uh, 36 starts up to this point. So he's definitely going to be someone from an uh, from an experience standpoint that checks all of those boxes. I uh, thought he had active hands and uh, pass protection, showed a sturdy base, uh, understood who to pick up, you know, against a variety of different blitzes, different stunts, uh, and different protections as well. So I think, like I said, from an experience standpoint, it's going to help him out a lot. Uh, solid agility and zone blocking schemes. Now, one thing that I really need to see a little bit more of is a little bit more improved power uh, on contact. Just try and get some more drive off the line of scrimmage and gap scheme. Uh, he's able to get his hands underneath the pads, but to really generate movement is something that he needs to improve on. Um, against uh, Michigan this past season, I thought that would be a really interesting game. It's one that I focused on uh, heavily just because if you look at who Michigan had on the interior defensive line last year and who they're bringing back this year, uh, he was going up against some real NFL defensive tackles. And for the most part, he held his own, so I was really impressed. He's not someone that's going to flash traits as a bona fide day one or a day two pick, but uh, for a day three, if you're on day three as an NFL team and you're looking for a center that has a lot of experience, he's really smart with a lot of room for improvement. He's going to be your guy. Uh, so is he is he clearly right now, does he go into the season as the top center in the Big Ten? Ooh, I don't know clearly for sure, but he's definitely, if you're looking for someone with a lot of experience, as I've talked about, it's going to be hard to find someone with the level of experience that he has. Do you think he's the top center right now? Dave? I mean, without studying everyone, I think it's going to be him or McLaughlin from, from Ohio State. Okay. I think, um, you know, I, I can't argue or dispute anything Hayden just said. So, you know, I would even defer to him. If he thinks that he's one of the guys in the Big Ten, I'm going to go with his word on that for sure. All right. Now, uh, Arante Ursary. Uh, let's talk about uh, the kid from Minnesota. And we were just talking a little bit about run blocking. Well, uh, there might not be a better run blocking uh, uh, tackle in all of college football, Dave. Yeah. I mean, he gets his hands on you with his feet underneath his hips. It's over. He, he's one of those guys. Um, and again, I, I don't want to term this as best tackle in the Big Ten, but I want to say he's probably one of the most intriguing names in the Big Ten, meaning there's a lot that he can do improvement-wise over the next two, three months compared to his 2023 tape that could put him in, you know, round two, maybe even round one territory territory uh six foot six 330 did not play start playing football until his junior year in high school so this happens throughout the draft cycle throughout the scouting process i wouldn't say often but every year you're going to find these guys that look a little raw they look a little uncomfortable they're a little inconsistent and then you find out these guys have played 10 years less football than some of these other prospects and it almost seems natural that they're just not they don't have the full skill set yet and to me that kind of gets me as a scout it gets me excited because they're, they're earlier on the progression curve. And if he's already shown these flashes after playing football for just a few years, imagine what he can do with a little bit more strength and conditioning focus, a pro caliber coach, and simply more experience. And, you know, he didn't really see the field much at Minnesota until 2022. And then in 2023, he took a really big jump up. He cut down on his penalties. The technique shortcomings uh, were less frequent. And even in uh, – Early in the year against uh, North Carolina, if you watched his first half tape of that game compared to the second half tape of that game, you see a different player. And this is what you want to see. We hear coaches and scouts talk about this at the Senior Bowl and the Shrine and the Hula every year. It's like, do these guys improve throughout the week with better coaching and better experience? Like, that's one of the biggest takeaways you can take from a player that doesn't have a lot of experience. Are they getting better? Are they learning from their mistakes? Um, you know, if this kid had been playing since he was 10 years old and he's a four year starter making some of the mistakes that he made technique wise, it discourages you a little bit. But to see that he's improving within a season, even within a game at that size profile, and then you also throw in the dominance, the flashes of dominance in the run game, especially it, there's something there with this kid. And I'm going to be really intrigued to watch him early in the year. All right. Well, if a Minnesota offensive lineman can end up as one of the top tackles in the country, that is newsworthy. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see how that works out for him. But yeah. yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, if he could be that good uh, with uh, the limited experience he has, 
just imagine what he could become this season. So it could yeah. be pretty scary. And if all works out for him, that could be very intriguing to watch his development. Before I let you guys go, uh, there's a couple other guys I wanted to throw out there that were not on your list. Uh, Jonah Monheim from USC and Riley Malman from Wisconsin. Um, uh, Monheim, I noticed uh, he, he plays just about everywhere. So I, he's played right left tackle. He's played right guard. So they've got him like switching all over the place. So that's good because uh, he's been effective just about every position that he's played. So I think Monheim is going to be somebody to keep an eye on as well. Malman from Wisconsin is like six foot eight. Um, and uh, is that a surprise coming from Wisconsin? They, they, they grow these kids like out there. Uh, that's just a, a, a way of living. So anyway, I just want to throw those two tackles out there, Monheim and Malman. I don't know if you guys have anything on, on, on those two or um, in general, what you just think about the offensive line talent uh, this season in the Big Ten before we wrap up. Yeah, I mean, I can start off there, Hayden. I mean, Monheim to me is a guy I did look at um, as we were preparing for this. Do I want to talk about him? He's one of the names I, I was the honorable mention <laughs> to, to be talked about. Um, I love the can't position. Talk, we can't talk about them all. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, I love the position versatility. That matters a lot to a lot of teams because you only get to dress so many guys on game day. You hear these post-draft press conferences, how many times that actually comes up. It, it's amazing. Uh, that and special teams. You know, if you're an offensive lineman that can really help back up multiple spots, it's going to really – improve your grade or outlook in a lot of different teams because it's, you know, it's a game of economics. You only get so many oh, yeah. spots. You only get to dress so many guys. And the fact that he has experience and success at inside and outside, right side and left side, um, that's going to be a big feather in his cap. So f from that, that initial standpoint, I like, I don't see him displacing defenders a lot. That's one thing I look for a lot um, at the college levels. I want these guys to be physically stronger than almost everyone they play against. And I didn't see that a lot. He's a little bit more of a finesse blocker to me, not the worst thing in the world, but he's not a young kid. I think he's going to be a 24 year old rookie. Um, but a lot of experience position versatility to me, he kind of screams like that round four, round five area. We'll see. Okay. You have anything hidden? Yeah. I was just going to say in terms of the talent overall in the big 10 this year, I think it's going to, be a really impressive class this year in the Big Ten. You look at some of the guys uh, that are, could be coming out this year. Uh, a lot of them are coming from some of the smaller schools in the Big Ten. We talked about the tackle from Minnesota. I talked about the center from Purdue. From a lot of these schools that typically you might see as middle of the road or even you know down the line in the Big Ten are going to have a dude this year on the offensive line that's going to come out. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they play throughout the season and you know if they're able to increase their draft stock to get into the uh, the top of the class. Yeah, as, as a Rutgers fan, uh, they, they've got a left tackle. Uh, and, and by the way, they have an offensive line coach with a Super Bowl ring. So uh, I'd keep an eye there. They might have a, a nice tackle uh, to keep an eye on this season. But again, we're going to talk more <clears throat> about all these players when we preview the season uh, in August. Uh, next week, actually, uh, well, yeah, next week, uh, we are on our next show. I should just say we are recording the defense. Actually, I think we're going to be live again on because uh, we're live for all of these shows on Friday, the scouting shows. Uh, we're going to be doing the Big Ten defense. So you can check us out uh, once again. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. And also don't forget to uh, order the – this is the 2023 draft review guide. 2024 guide should be out soon. Matter of fact, I believe today is our deadline. Uh, next 24 hours to go to print. So that's good news. So we'll be getting this out soon. Still have no idea who's on the cover. I just hope it's not Caleb Williams. That's boring. So uh, hopefully we'll have somebody like Richardson on the cover. And uh, don't forget to order that as well as the draft guide. If you haven't ordered that yet, it's still uh, very much in use because uh, we're only a couple of months after the draft and all those players haven't yet played in the NFL. They're going to training camp, and you want to get a good read on them. So you got the draft guide. You got the review guide. You can check that out on RLEDS.com. Um, and I believe you guys are both going to be back uh, to talk Big Ten defense. So uh, give me just uh, one quick preview. Give me a player. Dave? I just got done reading about Bear Alexander, D-tackle from USC, who has one of the most interesting – backstories that I'm going to share with you guys on Friday, uh, five high schools in four years. Oh. Uh, and just so, some background information that I think really disrupted some of his early progression, wow. but on the field, this guy has flashed some big time ability. And that, 
I have a feeling that this is going to be one of the best defensive tackles classes that we've seen nationally in a long time. And he has the ability to be in that discussion with, with the Bear Alexander. Bear military Alexander. Military family? Nope. Definitely no. not a military family. Okay. You, we, I will tell you more on Friday. Uh-oh. And uh, uh, go ahead, G- give me give me a player, Hayden. Yeah, absolutely. Someone I've been looking at is actually on the second level. I'm talking about uh, Jay Higgins from Iowa. He's going to be an ah. interesting, enticing linebacker this year. He's really undersized for the position, but he's someone that makes plays all over the field. So really excited to talk about him. All right. So again, that's coming up on our next video here. Uh, scouting our lads uh, goes uh, together, of course, and we'll be back uh, to talk more about the Big Ten. Uh, in just a little bit. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share, and we'll see you next time.